Good afternoon, everyone. This is South African Bar Association presentation. As you are aware, the South African Bar Association hosts a weekly event at no cost to participants and viewers to improve the skill sets of the legal profession. This initiative is aimed at making a fundamental contribution to developing the skill set of all and any persons who represent the South African public in our courts. It is my honor and, pr and privilege to introduce our eminent speaker today. Our speaker today is Advocate Bart Ford, currently a practicing advocate at Oxford Chambers Advocates and an expert on labor law. Advocate Bart Ford shall be addressing us today on a topic titled, Can Employees Make COVID-19 Vaccinations Mandatory for Employers? We are further honored and privileged to have Acting Judge Romeo Ntambelani to conduct the welcoming and conclusion of Advocate Bart Ford. A few housekeeping matters. These sessions are recorded and we appeal to participants to ensure that your microphones are muted and that your video cameras are switched off. Accordingly, during the address, all participants shall automatically be muted. If a participant has a question, simply raise your hand using the Microsoft Teams platform. During the question and answer session, Please restrict questions to the speaker relative, relative to the topic under discussion and only pose such question when called upon. Without any further ado, I now hand it over to Acting Judge Romeo Ntambuleni to conduct the welcoming. Over to you, Romeo. I think your mic is, uh, your mic is muted. Uh, just give me, just bear with me. Can you hear me? Uh, I can hear you now. I can hear you now. Thank you very much, AJ, uh, for this opportunity and, and a good afternoon to everyone. And uh, now, thank you again for this wonderful opportunity to introduce our you esteemed know, guest today. It's a great honor you know, uh, for me to you know, introduce our founding member of the you know, uh, South African Bar you know, Association, uh, Bart Ford. Uh, no, uh, but in, in short, uh, Bart, uh, prior to joining the South African Bar Association, and he held chairs and he was also a risk to his group. And then, prior to not doing that, he was a, commissioner, a senior commissioner at the CCMA. He has more than a experience, but the experience in, in terms of uh, advocate, but he has a PAP from UNISA, he has a CPIR uh, no, from Stellenbosch, and he has got HDE and uh, no, HDE from UWC, and he also has you know, an honors in labor law you know, from University of Johannesburg. So you can see that we are dealing with a very esteemed person with good experience in labor, and uh, we are going to actually enjoy this talk, and this is a very important talk at the time that we are actually at now. Now, without further ado, I give this uh, platform to Advocate Bartford. Thank you very much, AJ. Thank you. Over over to uh, Advocate Bart. You can you can just kindly unmute your your mic and your video. Well, thank you so much, AJ, and thank you again, Romeo, for your kind words, and uh, to all the participants who have taken the time to log in this afternoon. Thank you so much. I trust that we will have a fruitful few minutes together and thereafter we will have a brief discussion and then we'll, we'll leave it at that. So this afternoon's discussion is to, um, to dovetail the, the session that we had last week with Professor Shabir Mahdi. Uh, he dealt with the issue of COVID vaccinations and whether there may be lingering doubts or questions or queries. And I, I thought it very appropriate to this we continue where he left off, except we're dealing with a legal issue 
And that being, can employers make COVID-19 vaccinations mandatory for employees? The structure that I intend to uh, follow in, this, in, in addressing the topics are, insofar as today's session is concerned, the following topics will then be discussed. Namely, the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, the nature of the South African workplace. Does COVID-19 constitute a national health emergency justifying the interference with fundamental rights? Um, the principles set out in our case law and in the circumstances that ought to prevail in order for vaccinations to be made mandatory. Now, the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic, I think all of us present uh, would be able to attest that the COVID-19 pandemic has caused immeasurable, if not inestimable, devastation to the South African socio-economic landscape. Um, insofar as the labour market is concerned, it has been particularly badly affected. We have seen unprecedented job losses. We've seen closure of businesses, we've seen large scale layoffs, we've seen decline in productivity, and we've seen increased um, use in, insofar as sick leave is concerned, where, where sick leave um, entitlements have been exhausted. Um, and, and that is a direct effect of, of what COVID-19 has done. The only available means of defense against the scourge of the disease prior to vaccination was a combination of personal protective equipment and personal hygiene. With the benefit of science, our scientists now tell us that the best strategy against the COVID-19 pandemic is vaccination. And in essence, the reality that beset or before all of us, insofar as COVID-19 is concerned for South Africans, is there are one of five possibilities at play in South Africa, and in fact, all around the world, and insofar as it get, we get to COVID-19. The first is, there are some South Africans who will never contact COVID-19. That is a reality. It's possible, but highly improbable. The second possibility is the majority of South Africans will at some point or another contact COVID-19. The third possibility is that the majority of South Africans who contract um, COVID-19 will recover without being hospitalized. The fourth being a smaller percentage of those who contact COVID-19 will be hospitalized and will recover. And then the lastly and the saddest possibility is that some South Africans will in fact die from COVID-19. Now, it's in, in order to mitigate against the effects of possibility four and five that vaccines and vaccinations are regarded as increasingly important. Now, the South African workplace, uh, we, we, we found that in South Africa, we have two types of workplaces. The first being that we have got unionized workplaces where workers are organized and belong to particular trade unions. And you've got workplaces that are not unionized, the non ununionized workplaces. If an employer is to get to the point where a decision to implement a policy that would make COVID-19 vaccinations mandatory in the workplace. Such a policy would constitute a new term and condition of employment. And where new terms and conditions of employment are implemented or to be instituted in a unionized workplace, you must do it by way of collective bargaining meaning the parties must sit and jointly discuss and bargain on the implementation methodology, strategy, etc. insofar as the implementation of the new policy is concerned. In non-unionized workplaces, you'll have implementation by way of consultation for purposes of information sharing, not 
joint decision making or collaborative decision making as would be the case uh, in dealing with unionized workplaces. Now, a decision to make COVID-19 vaccinations uh, mandatory would result in a competing of fundamental rights. And what are these? Firstly, Section 12 of the Constitution as captured in the Bill of Rights provide that uh, every person shall have freedom and security of the person. Um, subsection 12.2 says everyone has the right to bodily and psychological integrity, which includes the right to make decisions concerning reproduction, to security in and control over their body, and C, not to be subjected to medical and scientific experiments without their informed consent. Section 12 provides, therefore, in context that every person has the right to make decisions on health and medical interventions and treatment that affects them, which must by implication include the acceptance or rejection of the vaccine. Similarly, Section 15 of the Bill of Rights provide, and in, in, insofar as the individual's right to freedom of religion, belief, and opinion, that everyone has the right to freedom of conscience, religion, thought, belief, and opinion. And again, Section 15.1 provides in context, therefore, that every person has the right to freedom of conscience, religion, thought, belief, and opinion, and that that right can also be interpreted to encapsulate the freedom of acceptance or rejection of the vaccine. However, all the constitutional scholars among us would know that Section 36 of the Constitution provides for the limitation of constitutional rights to the extent that the limitation is reasonable and justifiable in an open and democratic society based on human dignity, equality, freedom, and having regard to A, the nature of the right, the importance of the purpose of the limitation, the nature and extent of the limitation, the relation between the limitation and its purpose, and lastly, a less restrictive means to achieve the purpose. Now, Section 8.1 of the Occupational Health and Safety Act provides that uh, every employer shall take reasonable measures to ensure that the health and safety of, of employees in the workplace. What Section 8.1 of the Health and Safety Act uh, provides in summary is that employers have a duty to ensure the health and safety of employees and in failing to adhere to that duty attracts a criminal san a sanction or has at least the possibility of attracting a criminal sanction. The Act goes further to state that it requires every employer whose employees interface with the public to take reasonable measures to ensure that interface does not endanger the health and safety of the members of the public. This brings us then to the question, does COVID-19 constitute a national health emergency justifying the interference with fundamental rights guaranteed in the Constitution? Now, and as far as commenting on the extent of the public health emergency that dawned with the uh, with with COVID-19, um, it is true that there has never been a time in South Africa where government intervened to the extent that it has in respect in restricting public liberties, movement, and observance of health protocols in relation to a health emergency in the manner that we've experienced in recent times. In fact, it's unprecedented. The COVID-19 pandemic has had a detrimental impact on the economy, manifestly experienced in the labor market, as I've expressed and said earlier. 
we have and continue to lose work colleagues and family members on a frequent basis. I would hazard a guess that of each of the participants attending, we either know somebody directly or personally who have either succumbed or have been affected by COVID-19. Now, if it is true that mandatory vaccination can, either in the economy as a whole or in the workplace, result in employees being protected from serious if not fatal illness and enable the perseverance of, perseverance of jobs um, or acquiring jobs in an already depressed economy, then mandatory vaccination should be encouraged. Now, on the 11th of June, and this is extremely important for employers to note, on the 11th of June, the Minister of Employment and Labour published what was called an amended consolidation direction on occupational health and safety measures in certain workplaces. We refer to that as the direction. And it's effective from the 11th of June, 2021. Now, this particular direct is very instrumental in understanding how the issue of mandatory vaccination is to be approached. The, di the direction provides guidelines pertaining to social distancing, COVID-19 symptom screening, wearing of cloth masks, and the importance of ventilation in the workplace. Then section 63B, Roman numeral three of the guideline, provides that where an employee who presents with COVID-19 related symptoms is excluded from the workplace, the employee is entitled to sick leave. When this sick leave is exhausted, the employees are entitled to illness benefits in terms of Section 20 of the Unemployment Insurance Act. And the, in the previous direction, a claim could be made in terms of COVID-19, uh, the TER scheme, when sick leave has been exhausted, but this is no longer available under the amended direction. The direction makes provision for additional considerations relating to the vaccination of employees in the workplace. Now, what does it specifically say about vaccination of employees in the workplace? Section 31A, Roman numeral 2, provides that every employer must undertake a risk assessment within 21 days of coming into force of the direction. The risk assessment must stipulate, among others, whether the employer intends making the COVID-19 vaccination mandatory for its employees. If so, the employer should identify those employees who must be vaccinated due to risk of transmission through the nature of their work or the risk to contract COVID-19 due to their age or comorbidities. So this is a very important uh, um, provision in, in so far as uh, the amended directions are concerned. It carries on that the employer must develop a plan or amend an existing plan which outlines the measures that the employee intends to implement relating to the vaccination of its employees. The direction makes it clear that when implementing such a plan, employers must consider the employee's rights to bodily integrity, as well as the right to freedom of religion, belief, and opinion. The plan must take into account the guidelines contained in Annex C of the direction. In terms of Section 411, it provides that employers must provide workers with information raising awareness on the nature of vaccines to be used, the benefits associated with the COVID-19 vaccines, the contraindications for the vaccination, and the nature and risk of any serious side effects such as severe allergic reactions. Section 41K states that employers must give administrative support to assist its employees to register on the electronic 
vaccine data system registration portal. Section 4.1 L provides that employers must provide employees with paid time off to be vaccinated. And an employee must provide proof of the vaccination. So those then in essence what the requirements under the amended uh, health and safety measures are. Now, what are the principles set out in our case law thus far? At present, our courts have not as yet had the occasion to decide on the issue of compulsory vaccinations, uh, but it's only a matter of time before it does so. There are, however, cases where the courts have already expressed itself on the proper application of Section 12 of the Constitution, the section that I've referred to earlier so far as bodily integrity and the right to make decisions. In, in, the, in the matter of Minister of Safety and Security and another, with his GACA, the court relied on the public interest and applied what we call the Balancing Act of Rights to conclude that the respondent was forced to undergo surgery, albeit that he never consented to the surgery. So what was important in this particular case, which you could read at your leisure, is that the, the consideration was not so much the person's inherent fundamental rights, but rather the public interest that applied. Similarly, in the matter of Minister of Health, uh, in the province of the Western Cape versus Goliath and others, uh, the court compelled the surviving respondents to receive treatment for tuberculosis against their will. Now, in both these cases, the overriding decision and the overriding consideration for the court was the fact that the public interest outweighed the right to bodily and psychological integrity of individuals. This brings us to the question, therefore, what are the circumstances that they ought to or must prevail in order for vaccinations to be mandatory in the workplace? Firstly, there must, uh, regard must be had to the conditions set out in the directions because that gives us the, the almost the subordinate direction insofar as what the law provides for. So the next issue is, do employees in a particular workplace interface with the public? If the answer is yes, then an employer must take reasonable steps or measures to ensure that that interface does not endanger the health and safety of the members of the public. Following to that is, does vaccination constitute a reasonable measure? Now, the mere fact that the government's national program of vaccination is premised on the fact that vaccination is one of the primary measures for combating the pandemic, it is further augmented by the provisions in the directions, meaning vaccination does constitute a reasonable measure. So in essence, an answer to the question therefore is, can employers make COVID-19 vaccinations man mandatory for employees? The answer is yes. Subject to the following. Firstly, complying with the requirements set out in the directions. And if any of you would like a, a copy of, of the set of directions, we can make it available to you. We'll publish it on the website. Um, but most importantly, there must be a basis on which the setting out of particular justifiable grounds relevant to that workplace must be, must be clearly discernible. Meaning, in a particular workplace, it may very well be found that it would be uh, appropriate to have a number of employees vaccinated, giving a particular justifiable basis, but in that very same workplace, there might be a circumstances which would not warrant employees in, in another department to be subjected to um, mandatory vaccination. 
where the threat of transmission is proportional to the increase in, increased number and frequency of contact, it's an indication of the extent to which, under those circumstances, the vaccination may be warranted or regarded as mandatory. So in essence, the question is, what is the extent of the risk and how do we minimize the risk in relation to what is set out in the directions, the, the, the frequency of contact and the number of contact, and whether or not there are justifiable grounds relevant to that workplace that would recall or require differentiation for the purposes of administering the vaccine. Right, um, AJ, thank you. I, I see that uh, there is a question. I'm, I'm going to deal with questions now to the extent necessary. Thank you so much, Bart. Before I get to that, uh, can you kindly stop uh, sharing your screen? Thank you so much. Um, all right, um, Advocate Bart, I think I can speak on behalf of all the participants as well as those that will be watching this at their leisure when I say that your address was exceptionally informative and relevant. I have now opened a platform for a brief question and answer session. By way of a reminder, those that have a question, simply raise your hand using the Microsoft Teams platform, and when your name is called, simply unmute your mic and video to pose your question directly to Advocate Bart Ford. The first question is from Advocate Motebang. Advocate Motebang, you can simply unmute your mic and video. Uh, Advocate Bart. Hello? Yes, uh, Council, okay, I can hear you. You know, I'm saying I would truly appreciate for a very informative uh, presentation, but however, I just just few questions that I want to ask specifically in relation to a uh, constitutional jurisprudence in relation to this issue. One, in the case of Shabir Sheikh, I think this is uh, SABC or DA, if I remember quite well, I'm not quite certain about about other parties. <clears throat> but the issue in that case was the issue of the conflicts of the rights. One was saying that right to a fair trial or privacy, one was also dealing with the, of the public interest. So it's, it's a question of the conflict of rights. <clears throat> Why I'm asking this question, we, we, we have individual people who have got right to life, you understand, against that of the right that you've just spoken about, the bodily integrity, privacy, and the likes. Number two, on the conflicts of rights. That's the second point. Sec first question. The second question is, <clears throat> in in the first question of case of state versus state versus Zuma and subsequent to that state, is Ma state versus Makwanyani and state versus Mutongo, three of them were quite explicit actually on not on dealing with the proper interpretation of the provision of the Bill of Rights and that the Bill of Rights ought to be interpreted purposively and generously. Uh, that's number one. And also in State versus Makwanyan, what the then uh, Judge President Chakerson said, dealt with the principle of proportionality test, where the applicant ought to show that, demonstrate that your right has been infringed. Then against another one who said that the right is it reasonable and justifiable and limited and open democratic society, and also on those five factors. But other, the most important part, it's less restrictive means. So the issue is, the question primarily is that how then do you strike the balance between the two? I've got a right to life and also you have got right to bodily integrity in order for one to to be able to to balance the, the rights between the two because both of them are protected by the constitution. That's a right. That's what I wanted to ask. I don't know if it's clear. but Yes. Thanks, thank, thank you for that. So in, in, in essence, um, the, 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 the principles that you refer to in Shabir Sheikh and uh, State with Azumia and Makunani, they all seem to be saying, and, and so far as my reading of the authorities uh, are concerned, seem to be saying the same thing. And, and that is simply that when it comes to an individual's rights as, as um, provided for in the Bill of Rights, that under 
exceptional circumstances should a right which befalls a person under the, the Bill of Rights be uh, interfered with unless it could be demonstrated and it must be manifestly demonstrated that in fact the limitation thereof can't be achieved by, by means of a, a less restrictive manner in which to give effect to that right, firstly. And most importantly, that when a balancing exercise of rights is concerned, that it must be that the public interest, insofar as what one would regard as a a, a, a situation such as that we have in COVID, where you have a national pandemic, uh, which could be regarded as of, of such severe consequences that it constituted a public health emergency, that if one has to balance the, the, the manifest impact of um, individual rights versus the public health emergency, then one must say which of those rights uh, ought to rate higher or more uh, or ought to be considered more important in, in an open and democratic society underscored by rights and freedoms. Uh, I hope Mr. Banga managed to answer your question, but I see there's another question from Peter. No, thanks a lot. You did, uh, cousin. Thank you so much, Bart. Um, Peter, you can simply just unmute your mic and your video. Thank you, Advocate Ford. Can you hear me? I can. OK, uh, thanks very much for your presentation. Um, I'm a practicing Labour attorney in KwaZulu-Natal. <clears throat> and one of my question is, is when you're in a uni unionised workforce, you have um, the obligation to engage in collective bargaining. Now, that's all good and well, but it seems that that suggestion is in conflict with the directions that have been issued by the Honourable Minister in that it leads us into a situation where the employer now is obliged to negotiate with the trade union and issue of workplace discipline because we all might agree or disagree as to the severity of this pandemic that has now plagued our country and the world at large. But how do we overcome resistance at the collective bargaining table? Um, and if unsuccessful, then the employer is, is unintentionally placed in a, in a position where they fall foul of the directions issued by the Ministry of Labor. And, and I can just see, you know, a, a, um, a mutual interest issue coming to the fore and then the resultant consequences that go with that. Um, mm -hmm. I know I've, I've, I've raised several issues in, in my comment now, and I'll, I'll leave it to you to see if you can find a way through the muddy waters. <laughs> I, think, I, think, I, I think what you're raising is quite important. The the can one ever be placed in a situation where they, you, you're being obligated to bargain? So what, what the directions do, insofar as the amended direction, it's in fact requiring that an issue of discipline becomes a matter for, for uh, collective bargaining. Now, you and I know that discipline or matters pertaining to discipline ought never become a matter for, for, for collective bargaining at all. Now, the, I, I think the way in which it's approached is, is in essence, my reading of, of the regulation is as follows. There is a common understanding that we all need to do something about this. And what the minister is intending to, to, to do uh, is to see, can we not get the parties together to say that there, there, there appears to be uh, a benefit for us pursuing a basis on which vaccinations ought to be done or introduced within the workplace. The, the difficulty is, do you introduce it as a way of saying this is a policy for purposes of, the, of implementing a new term condition of employment? 
Because if you do that, then you're in fact raising a collective bargaining issue that ought to have been, uh, been come about by the parties themselves. But in this particular instance, the minister is saying, I am going to introduce the topic and allow the two of you as, as collaborative parties to try and make some sense out of it. Because in essence, is, and if you read the amendments, it, it deals with what to do, how to approach it, in, in, in order to get a, a, a maximum buy-in, and to the extent that there are employees who do not buy in, how that process ought to unfold in, in order to ensure that employees are not uh, subjected to discipline. So it is a means, I, su I suppose, by the minister to try and get the parties to talk to one another and accepting, of course, that a, a duty to bargain cannot be enforced on any of the parties. Peter, that's as best as I seen it, but I think um, one must probably see it from the point of view that the, the, the interest of trying to uh, make good out of a very, very difficult situation is what, what, what promoted the pursuance of what the minister set out in the regulations. That, that's all I can say. Yes, uh, Advocate Ford, I, I agree with everything that you've said. Uh, I would like to just put my, my comment on that is that I feel it would be incumbent upon the Honourable Minister of Labour to then announce this on a national, on national media, formal media, saying, country, employees, this is the problem, and this is how we need to respond to our employment responsibilities, which extend obviously to, to the public and the public interest and our homes and families, etc. So if it is, has to be introduced by the employer, going to the employing, saying, listen, uh, Mr. Trade Union, the minister said this, that, and the other thing, is an inherent distrust with all of these um, collective bargaining meetings that start along the latter uh, description, as opposed when the, the government makes a proper uh, formal announcement, hang on, here are the directions, and this is what your employers are going to be coming to you with. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. And, and just to add before you go, I, I think... Um, a lot more need to be done to um, for, for employers to know that in fact the uh, cons amended consolidated directions are available and in fact there should have been robust discussion um, in all workplaces about what the amendments say and uh, the extent to which especially the unionized workplaces would be affected by it. Yes, thank you so much. Good. Bye-bye. You're welcome. Thank you so much, uh, Advocate Bart, and uh, thank you, Peter, for those uh, for those comments. Advocate Bart, I have a question. From your address on whether employees can make vaccinations mandatory, you answered positively in that regard, further submitting that naturally, with adherence to the regulations, such as social distancing, and more particularly the justification element of which I submit can be varied widely. The justification element is where my question or rather cl clarification emanates from. Now in asking my question, I'll, I shall place before you two exceptionally extreme ended scenarios and ask you where you would find the middle ground to such. The first scenario being an employee who is a construction assessor, works primarily from home, however, on occasions say, once every month will go out into an open field and conduct assessment where he seldomly encounters anyone. The second scenario being an employee who is a health worker who is exposed to many people on a daily basis, often the elderly and others who are at risk of severe underlying medical conditions. Now, naturally, in the first scenario, it would not be, it would not, it would not be justifiable for such employee to be subjected to mandatory vaccinations. However, the employer in the second scenario, it would be justifiable to submit as, as such employee to mandatory vaccinations. Now we both, uh, now, now we find ourselves somewhere in the middle of such those situations. So my question to you, in your view, what would your advice to the employee be in circumstances of such? 
Thank you, AJ. I think that's a very important question. Um, so, so in order to subject employees to mandatory vaccination, there must be a justifiable reason to do so. Like we've seen in the case law that I've referred to earlier, there was the, the justification there was the public health concern. Now, in the absence of a justifiable reason, any instruction to subject an employee to mandatory vaccination would be arbitrary. And that is what the, what the amendment, in fact, uh, go, uh, speaks against of any form of arbitrariness. Now, insofar as your first example and scenario where you have the construction assessor who works from home and uh, if not from home in an open field, there it is clear that insofar as the concerns raised in terms of Section 8.1 of the Occupational Health and Safety Act, that that would not be applying because in Section 8.1 there is no direct contact with the public. Um, it's also clear that insofar as his interaction with others are concerned, whether it be the public or other employees, that it's even further minimized. And the minimization is in relation to the fact that he doesn't have contact with him, he's been worse from home. Under those circumstances, I cannot see a justification for mandatory vaccination. In the circumstances such a scenario B, where where in fact the elements that apply there would be exposure, frequency, and risk. Where your exposure is, exposure is increased, proportional to your frequency thereof, it has not on effect on the risk. And under those circumstances, an employer would be justified, such as in your scenario with medical personnel. I can think, for instance, in such situations, circumstances where you have a domestic employee who looks after small children, or you have in a situation where you have a palliative care worker or a, 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 a person who looks after the frail and, and, and the sickly, uh, who interacts with them on a regular basis, where social distancing protocols cannot uh, consistently be complied with that under those circumstances, it would be justifiable for an employer to ask that the employee be subjected to mandatory vaccination. Uh, sorry, just on a follow up on that right now, on the middle grounds of that, obviously we find I gave you two extreme ends of it, but what if we find ourselves as, say I'm an I, I am an employer and I find based on that, uh, based on this scenario, I find that a particular employee, it's not justified for that particular employee to come in because hypothetically speaking, they don't come into the office that often, they're on the field and they don't come into the office that often. But what happens, and based on that assessment alone, I may, I, it, I don't deem it justifiable for that particular employee. employee. However, for whatever reason, that it, it, it may be that particular employee does happen to come into contact, which can happen on occasions. And how will how will we work through that? Now I'm now I heard you said that obviously case law is still to 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 come into play. But what would be your your opinion on that? Because if we just have it open ended, where or if we rather have, my submission is that we, it should be universal. That it that it 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 should be mandatory universally, and it shouldn't be up to the employer's discretion. Yeah. I, AJ, I understand where you're coming from, but in, in, in as far as, as, as an employer were to adopt a policy where you apply it universally, or the term that I'd prefer to use is that you um, apply it co co consistently throughout the, the, the business, one must look at the specific uh, individual the, the 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 role that the individual play employee plays within the workplace and and then have regard to it uh, as to whether or not under those circumstances it would be um, 
justifiable to have that person be subjected to, to vaccination. Let, let me give you an example. M my brother, for instance, works from home. He works for, for MassMart and he works as the workforce skills um, plan assessor. He works from home and he has no interaction with, with his colleagues at, at work on a direct interface person-to-person -person basis. His circumstance is entirely different to a situation where you have a teller who interacts with, uh, in one of the mass mart stores, with members of the public who, 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 who she interacts with as they come past her and she um, t t tallies their bills and, and scans their products. So one would need to look at if there's a differentiation, how that differentiation would apply. Because unless you can justify, your decision would be arbitrary. Right. Thank you. I see Bengal is with us. There's a, there's a, thank you so much, uh, Bart, for that. There's a question from uh, Acting Judge Romeo Tambulani. Acting uh, Romeo, you can simply unmute your mic. Okay. Uh, uh, no, thank you very much, uh, you know, you know, Bart, for such an informative conversation. And I would want, want to confirm and say to you, I, I also lost a sister through you no know, COVID. So this is a very serious issue that we are talking about, you not know, today. And I want you to, you know, you know, to address the point of refusal you know, to vaccinate. If you refuse you know, to vaccinate and also uh, you know, dismissal for, you know, for refusal you know, of, of vaccination. Yeah, thank you. Because if, if a person is raising the grounds, the constitutional grounds that family and yourself, and they are really raising religious grounds that they don't want to vaccinate on, on, on the basis of uh, religious ground and you, know, uh, you cannot apply limitation insofar as their religious you know, uh, concerns are, are, are dealt with and uh, they are in a situation where they are exposed to other people. How are you actually going to deal with that? Because you know, uh, it's, it's quite important, uh, it's a quite important right of religious beliefs of a person. And when are you going to say you know, you're going to dismiss? What criteria are you going to use for dismissal? Uh, dismissing such a person and also the issue of refusal being you know, to be to be vaccinated on based on religious ground or any constitutional grounds that has been raised that you have conversed in the beginning of this conversation. Thank you. Right. Uh, so, so Romeo, firstly we need to we need to understand at what point we speak about refusal. Right. So. Yeah. What the code what the code envisages is circumstances where it is concluded that in a particular circumstance it is justifiable for an employee to be subject to, to subjected to a mandatory vaccination. Meaning the, the, the groundwork, so to speak, has been done and it, these employees have been identified as employees who ought to be vaccinated or uh, should make themselves available for mandatory vaccination. Now, section uh, paragraph four of the code of the amended uh, direction deal with that. It says that the employee must be engaged and the employer must consider short of, of, of following a disciplinary route, um, what other avenues could be explored short of following a, 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 the, the disciplinary process. But let's assume, for purposes of your access, well, the exercise in your question, is that the, the employer has set out justifiable grounds. The employee is not uh, uh, heeding to those grounds and in fact still feels that the basis on which the request to have him or her vaccinated is unfair and unreasonable. Now, Remember, there are only three reasons that an employer can ever terminate an employee's uh, uh, employment. It must be either for misconduct, for incapacity, or for operational reasons related to, to retrenchment. So we now know it has nothing to do with retrenchment, which leaves us with it's either misconduct or incapacity. But it cannot be misconduct 
in this particular instance, it is simply the employee is no longer in a position to give effect to a condition of employment that is required by an employer. So it becomes a, a species of incapacity. So the, 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 the short answer is one should try everything, and, and that's what the, the, the amended direction uh, provide for, to accommodate the employee. But should accommodation fail, then the employer would find itself in a position where it may have to consider terminating employee's employment uh, on grounds of incapacity. Thank you. That, uh, thank you so much. Romeo, does that answer your question? Uh, uh, but I really have to answer your answer. Yeah, it does. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Bart, there's a question from Tingan. Tingan, you can simply unmute your mic and your video. Good, good afternoon, uh, uh, Advocate. Uh, thanks for the informative session. Um, I, I really hold you uh, as a professional in very high esteem. Um, I just have uh, two questions uh, which I want to run by you. The first question is, it's not a, a legal question, it's just a information that we have in the public domain suggests that uh, if you have vaccinated, it does not uh, preclude you from contracting the virus. Uh, and I would assume it, it, it also does not preclude you from passing on the virus. So, so what, what would be the, the real basis for any employer to insist that uh, employees uh, vaccinate or suggest that employees that are not vaccinated uh, are putting others at, at more risk than the ones that have not vaccinated. Just from a logical point of view, is it not a loophole? Is it not something that can can be argued uh, uh, from that angle? The, the second question, I just need your view. Um, uh, you would have heard in the news that the Kuro uh, group of schools has almost taken a position that if a teacher or an employee um, does not want to vaccinate, they will consult that employee and, and might uh, actually retrench that employee, which, which, which borders on um, rendering them operationally uh, not employable. So they, they will dismiss them based on operational requirements. What are the legal loop, loopholes in, in, in that approach, given the response that you've just given now? Well, uh, thank you. Firstly, Dingan, uh, let me just qualify. I'm not a medical practitioner at all, so I can only defer to the, 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 the scientists. And last week we had Professor Mahdi, who explained when this particular issue was raised as to if, the, if, if a vaccinated person can still contract uh, uh, COVID, that what is could be the rationale, and he explained that the the there is a reduced. It's not impossible, but there's a reduction in the possibility of a vaccinated person transmitting the uh, the, the 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 virus and infecting others but that the, 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 the possibility is exacerbated increasingly uh, in favor of employers, employees who were not vaccinated. Meaning, if there are 100 people, if I give an example, that uh, have uh, COVID-19, that are from amongst those who have in fact contacted the virus, the majority of them would have received it from those who are unvaccinated than those who are vaccinated. He explained further, and if you can, please go to the website and listen to that session last week. He explained further that the idea with vaccination is not, we're not vaccinating against the, uh, uh, against one's ability not to um, transfer 
the uh, the disease that it's, 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 we, we're preventing uh, serious uh, health ailments insofar as hospitalizations and death is concerned, because that will also have an impact on the employment labor market sector. Insofar as your second question is concerned, whether the Curo group can retrench a person for not subjecting himself to, to vaccination, I, I, I submit one would must be careful in terms of how would you approach. Remember, the retrenchments would be regarded as an operational no-fault dismissal. And in, in, a, in, a, in a particular instance, it would be where if a person is required to meet a certain standard and the person is not able to meet that standard and the standard being you need to be vaccinated in order to teach, that becomes the condition of employment, then I can't see how a, 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 your failure to meet a condition of employment would be able to be regarded in the same way as an operational dismissal. But again, you, you know, we, we, when we come to labor law, there are so many different interpretations to, to a singular set of facts. But I would be surprised that one would be able to pursue it via a retrenchment route. Thank you, Advocate Bart. Thank you, Bart. Uh, Bart, this is a question from Al Bogan. Al Bogan, you can simply unmute your mic and your camera. Good afternoon, Council. Thank you for the informative session. I just want to put two questions to you. Firstly, what would the burden of proof be on an employee to show that the mandatory vaccination is not justifiable? And then my second question would also be, what is an employee's recourse in going about challenging a mandatory vaccination and then subsequently being dismissed for that very reason? What would, where would your starting point be? Thank you, Lishan. So the, the, the first question is, what's the balance of proof that the employee would need to, uh, uh, to if I understood you correctly, to, to demonstrate that the decision is not justifiable? Yes, that is correct. So, so if, if an employee is of the view that the requirement that the employer places on him or her to be vaccinated is not justifiable, the employee would simply need to demonstrate that the, the employer's basis for concluding that it's justifiable is not reasonable. Meaning, one would need to look at the obviously the specific set of facts that apply. Uh, again, if I use the example um, of my brother who works from home, who, 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 uh, who generally has very little contact with um, mass mart staff, if there's a decision that he must be vaccinated. Under those circumstances, you would then be able to demonstrate that none of the concerns raised in the amended directions or in the uh, Section 8.1 of the Occupational Health and Safety Act applies, or that he places himself or others at risk, or that there's been no increased frequency in so far as contact, which would expose him or others to risk. That will then be able to demonstrate that a decision to subject yourself to uh, mandatory vaccination under those circumstances would be would, would not be justifiable. Now, the recourse that one would have is obviously if an employer was to say, well, I am going to terminate your employment because the basis for your refusal is unreasonable. And let's assume for the purpose of the exercise, they terminate you based on, on and insofar as my understanding would be for purposes of incapacity, then the, the employee would simply be able to go to the CCMA or the bargaining council with jurisdiction and say, well, um, we are, I'm of the view that the, the, the basis for the instruction to subject myself is unfair and, and challenge it at that forum. That would be the approach that I would follow. I hope that answers the question, Lee. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Ed. Um, the Bart, Bart, there's a question from the brain. The brain. Can you so you can simply unmute your mic? 
Um, good afternoon, Advocate. Um, I've just got a few questions for you. Sure. Uh, there's families working in one household. Um, some may be working, you know, from home. Some may be working for a department or for a company. So you do still get interactions um, between these people within a family communion, then also um, even if everybody is working from home in a, fa a specific fam family, you may still be get um, contaminated when you are going and buying groceries. So you are still having a risk from being contaminated uh, or infected. Um, within government in general, there is no longer a rule for us to just be Department of Health officials working in uh, general. We are all working these days 100% uh, basically in government, whether it's level three lockdown or not. Um, based on the fact that suppliers have to be um, paid, service has to be continued, you have to account for the money that um, is being provided, etc. So it's difficult to just isolate health because everybody is here at risk. Now, if you do get a person that are um, infected and a person that are being um, taking the vaccination, yes, you do get a minor risk for being uh, infected by the virus, but you can still be infected because you will still get flu-like symptoms. With a person having a commodity or comorbidity, actually is the right word. Um, if you aren't injected with the vaccine, your risk is so much higher to be probably, sorry for the word, dying by being infected by the virus. Um, and even if you are injected for the vaccination, when you are a comorbidity, you will still get sometimes ill, iller than another person will just get normal flu-like symptoms. The other issue that I would like to ask you is also, how are you, if you're just going to do it from a labor perspective, how are you going to deal with the unemployed to get them vaccinated because they will not be covered under this uh, labor um, regulations because they're not employed, um, even your farming communities. So I think we need to look at the general public and maybe from a health per, per, uh, professional perspective in terms of uh, the Disaster Management Act, maybe looking at a clause or regulation that we make it more justifiable for the the concern of the general public to be the more interesting party to be their rights to be um, basically. Can you uh, sorry, can I continue? Yes. Carry on. Okay, um, it's just the general public is for me a, mo a greater concern in terms of the constitution than an individual's right. Um, and I think just more people getting the vaccine, the less likely we will get infected. Um, so for me, the general public interest is for me the core here and maybe looking more at the regulation from the Disaster Management Act. And instead of trying to look at labor relations perspective and forcibility whereby some people are working from home and not working from home, it doesn't really matter because I had a situation in my own household that um, whether you even working from home or not, your fellow uh, people, my son, for example, were constantly um, in a very dangerous situation with um, Department of Justice being constantly 
uh, exposed in the private sector with the regional court, um, district court, high court, um, and up until the time that they decided to try virtual platforms. Um, my husband working at the Department of Health. Um, and um, whether it is a situation of um, you've been still exposed, even if you are comorbidity. Uh, it, it is really a, a very catch-22 situation here. Um, th th thank you so much for that question, uh, uh, Azad Aldridge. I'm sure how to pronounce your surname. Look, I, I think to, to the extent that you're saying that even if you work from home, unless you work in such circumstances where you are not exposed to others, the risk that you would have whilst you're working in a uh, formal office setting is in fact exactly the same risk that you would have at home given the proximity and regular in the frequency of contact. And if that is the case, then I think under those circumstances, the individuals in that household may very well uh, amongst themselves get to the point where they say, you, you know what, albeit that we're working from home, we are in fact uh, um, it, it, placing others at risk by our interaction with one another. And if one is infected, the other person may also become infected. So in that particular instance, whilst it might not be a, a, a requirement from a labor point of view, it might be from a, a person to person uh, ameliorative uh, uh, care for others in a benevolent sense that would uh, cause one to say, look, under those circumstances, I suggest we should be uh, subjecting ourselves to, to vaccination. And you're quite correct that um, the, the fact that you uh, may, may be vaccinated it does not mean you won't get the, um, you will not contact COVID. In, in fact, uh, as we listened last week is, you, you, you may very well still contact COVID, except that your symptoms or the extent of the effect of the disease will be far lessened than what would be the instance if you're unvaccinated. As to whether the unemployed in the farming community, uh, one could, th that is certainly something that the government at some point will need to give direction on as to what to do where the public interest uh, should be considered by far the more important uh, consideration than individual interest. I hope that answers your question. I think AJ, we can do with one more question and then we'll call the session to an end. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, Advocate Bart, due to time restrictions, I have closed the question and answer session. I now hand it back over to, uh, to Judge Romeo Tambeleni for the conclusion. Over to you, Judge. Uh, thank you very much. And, uh, you know, uh, Bart, thank you so much for you know, uh, giving us such a wonderful talk. You can see that if we continue with this talk, we can talk up until the cows come home. Uh, because people are very much interested in this banning topic, and I think uh, we'll take it off uh, you know, this platform and, and also continue uh, on another platform to actually share this important knowledge that you have shared today. So it's quite important. We want to really thank you for uh, what you have done, and it shows that uh, this kind of pandemic that we are facing now needs a collective uh, effort that all hands must be on deck. There is no one size fits uh, you know, approach. So thank you very much for. Uh, your presentation today and we hope that you know you will engage us further in future with very interesting and informative topics and we really appreciate your time we really appreciate you and we hope that everything will still go well and we'll have to hear more you know from you in the future thank you so much but thank you thank thank you Bart. uh following on um on acting judge romeo and tambalani's um advice I, it should, I, I think I can speak on your behalf when I say that should participants and or viewers have any burning question, they could simply email you and, and inquire and, um, and pose such question to you if, that's, if you'll be willing to, to accept such.
Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your attendance. By way of final conclusion, on behalf of the South African Bar Association, we sincerely thank Advocate Ed Bartford for his informative address and his time. We would further th like to thank Ed Acting Judge Romeo Ntambeleni for his exceptional welcome and conclusion, and obviously his time too. Appreciation to all those who have participated virtually and shall be watching this session at their leisure. These sessions are recorded and the recordings can be found upon the South African Bar Association website that being www.rsabar.net. I thank you.